Yo me siento feliz al pisar hoy por primera vez la noble tierra americana y traigo un saludo muy cordial del pueblo y del gobierno dominicanos para el pueblo y el gobierno americanos. Agradezco profundamente la recepción que se me ha ofrecido hoy a nombre del gobierno y pongo mi corazón al servicio de los ideales de paz, de unión y de cordialidad en el continente americano. This is Rafael Leonidas Trujillo Molina, who ruled the Dominican Republic from 1930 to 1961. He came to power in 1930, and by 1940, he controlled most of his nation's economy through his monopolies of the country's most basic products. By 1960, his investments had skyrocketed, and his personal fortune, estimated to be in excess of $800 million, was the sixth largest in the world at that time. Trujillo controlled virtually all the important industries, including 60% of the nation's vital sugar industry, while U.S. companies controlled another 30%, leaving the remaining 10% in the hands of the established Dominican oligarchy. Under the dictator's influence, industry flourished. Solid Dominican institutions were created, foreign debt eliminated, and the country enjoyed a higher level of political and economic autonomy. This kind of progress had never been known in the history of the Dominican Republic, and it was monitored closely and kept within the margin allowed by the U.S. government during the latter half of the 20th century. In his exercise of power, he exhibited a complete lack of scruples, using fraud and dishonesty to gain whatever he desired. If these measures failed him, he would not hesitate to resort to violence and murder. He permitted no opposition to his regime, and it is difficult to determine how many people died under his dictatorship. Conservative estimates place the death toll at 30,000. 30,000 human beings lost their lives, either for the political gain or personal whim of Trujillo and his family during his 30-year rule. Trujillo's career begins during the years of the American military intervention of 1916 to 1924. On the 15th of May, 1916, U.S. Marines invade the Dominican Republic allegedly to defend the government of Juan Isidro Jimenez from the forces of Desiderio Arias. The occupation forces claim that the Dominican Republic has violated the Dominico-American Convention of 1907. After disarming the entire population, the American troops proceed to organize the Dominican National Guard by recruiting ex-military men and youths that had gained their trust. It is this organization that a young Rafael Trujillo enters on December 18, 1918. His first trial by fire 
is in the battles and assaults that the invading U.S. troops mount against the nationalist fighters, commonly called guerrilleros or highwaymen, in the eastern part of the country. <laughs> Trujillo enrolls in the military officer school in Jaina, on the outskirts of Santo Domingo. Upon his graduation with honors, he is commissioned an officer of the National Guard. Under the tutelage of the American military, Trujillo learns the skills needed to administer a military force and further sharpens his own gift for leadership. American Marine Major Thomas E. Watson, referring to Trujillo in a report, calls him a serene man, controlled, energetic, active, and industrious, and considers him to be one of the best in the service. By the following October, Trujillo is promoted to the rank of captain in the Dominican National Police and named commander of the 7th Company headquartered in San Francisco de Macorís. On February 23, 1924, Major Cesar Lora, the commander of the Northern Military District, dies in a tragic accident in the city of Santiago. Five days later, the newspaper Lestin Diario, published by Arturo Pelerano Sarda, a staunch supporter of the future president Horacio Vasquez, editorializes, various persons have asked us about who will succeed Major Cesar Lora in the Northern Military Command. We beg them to think about someone whose character is up to the task, the Honorable Captain Trujillo, a young military man with the best record in the service and one of its most serious and powerful members, in addition to his renown in society. On the 12th of July, 1924, the U.S. Marines complete their withdrawal from Santo Domingo. They leave behind the country with an organized economy tied to U.S. interests, with a Dominican customs unit administered by American officials, and a National Guard organized and trained by U.S. Marines. At the same time, the Americans build three principal highways, introduce a new system of land ownership which significantly increases sugar production and implement institutional changes that modernize the productive capacity of the country. They also add to the country's growing external debt to the U.S. in order to finance expensive public works programs and prevent the Dominican government from renegotiating new international loans without previous authorization from the American government. These restrictions, enforced since the 1907 Convention, are again implemented in the Dominico-American Convention Treaty of 1924. It was in defense of the earlier document that provided a pretext for the American invasion of 1916. same day as the U.S. troops finish their withdrawal, General Horacio Vasquez is sworn in as president after a landslide victory against his opponent, Francisco J. Pernado. Under the Vasquez administration, Trujillo is provisionally promoted to major and is made commander of the Northern Military Command headquartered in Santiago. Shortly afterwards, Trujillo is promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and Chief of Staff of the Army, headquartered at Fort Osama. Okay. 
Necesita José, buen caballo, un revólver, una silla y su mujer. El que quiera ser hombre, necesita José, buen caballo, un revólver, una silla y su mujer. Ya tú no te acuerdas cuando íbamos al bambú Que cerrábamos la puerta y apagábamos la luz Esa noche voy para allá, desde ahora te lo aviso Si acaso suena la puerta, una leja boca al quicio Muchacha, tú no te acuerdas cuando íbamos al bambú Que cerrábamos la puerta y apagábamos la luz esta noche voy para allá, desde ahora te lo aviso, si acaso suena la puerta, un tal es la boca al quicio. My concern in dealing the problems of these times has been to avert from you our cold amongst those upon whom the blow has fallen with heartbreaking severity, that is our unemployed workers. No man who has seen this battle as I have seen it, with the stark efforts of American faith and confidence in her people, could harbor a doubt for the future of the American people. On January 4, 1930, President Vasquez returns from Baltimore, and although he is weak and still convalescing from his surgery, he resumes his duties as president. His closest advisors immediately inform him of Trujillo's conspiracy to overthrow him, but he pays no attention to these warnings and is reassured by Trujillo's promises of loyalty. The beginning of 1930 sees the Dominican Republic plunged into a deep economic crisis. Triggered by the dwindling prices of Dominican products in the American market, gross revenues dropped from a high of $28.8 million in 1928 to $9.5 million during the Great Depression. This provokes a wave of discontent and an acute state of political crisis that grips the principal institutions of the Dominican state. In light of this situation, politicians court Trujillo, trying to gain his army's backing for their own political ambitions. One of these men is an attorney named Rafael Estrella Urania, who has served as ambassador in Rome for the Vasquez government during the rise of Italian fascism. When he returns to the Dominican Republic, he establishes, along with several other professionals from Santiago, the Republican Party. This group of collaborators began a clandestine conspiracy with the head of the army, General Trujillo. Trujillo's efforts at obtaining political power are constantly thwarted by the American embassy's refusal to support him. And for this reason, he sends three of his closest collaborators, Colonel Vasquez Rivera, Rafael Vidal Torres, and Robert Despradel to consult with the American Colonel Richard M. Cutts, who had been Trujillo's superior officer during the military intervention, and who now resided in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where he was supervising the U.S. Marines that occupied that country. In January 1930, the U.S. Ambassador in Santo Domingo, Evan Young, who had great influence over Trujillo, and to whom Trujillo had promised to respect the constitutional order, was replaced by Charles B. Curtis. Sunday, February 
with massive public support and the Cibao, the breadbasket of the Dominican Republic, Rafael Estrella Urena seizes the fort of San Luis in Santiago. The rebels, with the aid of civilians and supported by men like Desiderio Arias and Elias Bracci, find no resistance and immediately organize a march to the capital. The next day in Santo Domingo, the military forces announce their support for Urena. As his columns approach the city, Urena urges President Vasquez, his wife, Doña Trina de Moya, and members of his cabinet to seek asylum in the U.S. Embassy. Ambassador Curtis assures President Vasquez that asylum will not be necessary, since General Trujillo has assured him of his loyalty toward the government. Moments later, the entire party, including Curtis, leaves for Fort Ozama. Once inside the fort and face to face with the general, President Vasquez asks, General, I want to know, am I your president or your prisoner? Trujillo answers, Mr. President, you are my president. I await your orders. Immediately, Vasquez orders Colonel Jose Alfonseca, a military leader he trusted completely, to take 200 men and stop Urena's men who were approaching Santo Domingo on the Duarte Highway. But when President Vasquez leaves Fort Ozama, Trujillo gives instructions to Colonel Simon Diaz to find Colonel Alfonseca and relieve him of his duties and thus allow the rebel column to advance into the city. On Tuesday, February 25th, Santo Domingo is taken by the rebels who fire symbolic shots into the air while Trujillo maintains his troops in the garrison. Finally, through the mediation of the U.S. Embassy, the rebels and President Horacio Vasquez reach an agreement. They agree to the following. One, President Vasquez will resign immediately and Rafael Estrella Urena will be named Minister of the Interior, so that in keeping with the Constitution, he could then assume the presidency. Two, a cabinet with representatives of all the political parties will be appointed. Three, the results of the next general election on May 16, 1930 will be honored and respected by all sides. Four, all restrictions regarding the candidates will be removed, with the exception of Dr. Alfonseca and General Trujillo, who will not be allowed to run for president in these elections. Several days after the accord is signed, Rafael Estrella Urena is sworn in as president of the Republic. At first, he names cabinet members from both supporters of Horacio Vasquez and Velasquez, as well as friends of his. However, a repressive military influence forces the majority to resign, allowing Trujillo supporters to take their places in the cabinet. On March 7, 1930, Charles B. Curtis sends a report marked Top Secret to the U.S. State Department in which he refers to Trujillo as follows. Of all the prominent men in the Dominican Republic, Trujillo is the most ingenious, astute, and treacherous dangerous to both his friends and his enemies, disloyal with his word and action, always looking to favor his interest by good and bad methods, and determined to be the hand that guides the new regime. He aspires to be another dictator, just like Ulises Ero, and God protect us if he ever gains power. While it was rumored that Trujillo would proclaim himself a candidate for the presidency, the army unleashed a wave of terror in every region of the country. By mid-March, six tiny parties had united under the name of the Confederation of Parties, and they in turn proclaim Rafael Leonidas Trujillo 
as their presidential candidate and Rafael Estrella Urena as vice president. At the same time, the supporters of Horacio Vasquez organize under the banner of the National Party, and the Velasquez supporters of the Progressive Party reunite and revive the National Progressive Alliance in order to back their own candidates for the presidency, attorneys Federico Velasquez and Angel Moraves. In 1930, the major source of revenue for the Dominican Republic came from the collection of customs duties and from the sugar industry, the former controlled by the U.S. government and the latter by U.S. companies. Those administrations not recognized by the U.S. government could not make use of the funds generated by either of these two sources. Therefore, the U.S. would play an important role in determining the political outcome of any election. Like any politician, Trujillo naturally jostled for position. From the onset, he courted the U.S. government for his presidential aspirations. March 27, 1930. Trujillo accompanies Rafael Brache and Roberto Despradel to Camendador, a village close to the Haitian border, where with State Department authorization, he meets with Colonel Richard M. Cutts of the U.S. Marine Corps. Thirty days later, Trujillo says, No hay peligro en seguirme. Porque en ningún momento la investidura con que pueda favorecerme el resultado de los comicios de mayo servirá para tiranizar la voluntad popular a la cual sirvo en este momento y a la que serviré lealmente en el porvenir. The opposition candidates retire from the election process and ask the Court of Appeals in Santo Domingo to cancel the upcoming elections. May 16, 1930. General elections are held with only one single candidate on the ballot. General Rafael Leonidas Trujillo Molina. According to the estimates, only 25% of the eligible voters cast their ballots, but Trujillo was proclaimed the winner with 223,851 votes, many more votes than the number of registered voters. horrible assassination of Vasquez supporter Virgilio Martinez Reina and his pregnant wife proved how far Trujillo and his supporters could go in their struggle to gain power. In June, the opposition organized a military revolt throughout the country with the aim of overthrowing Trujillo. In Moca, General Cipriano Ben Cosme leads a band of rebels into the mountains. In Santiago, Piro Estrella hides in the mountainous regions of the north. Trujillo confronts the revolt with vigor, ordering the arrest of all opposition leaders and personally leading the operations against the rebels in Moca. 
que para hacer el bien es necesario ser fuerte, que el bien hay que imponerlo. After five months of relentless pursuit, General Cipriano Bescosme is killed in battle. Two months before Trujillo's inauguration, the opposition forces were left with two clear choices, either submit to his will or go into exile. This last choice was only for those few who were still alive. On August 16, 1930, amidst a grand and monumental ceremony, where alms were given to the poor and champagne flowed without limit to the military brass and special guests, Rafael Leonidas Trujillo Molina was sworn in as constitutional president of the Dominican Republic. Trujillo had reached the highest political position in his land by the age of 37. Yet he carried with him a deep resentment of the social groups that had snubbed him before. That resentment would stay with him the rest of his life and would be a factor in most of his words and deeds. To understand the origin of these sentiments, which took root in the very core of his being, it is worthwhile to look at his beginnings in the small town of San Cristobal. Born October 24, 1891, to a provincial lower middle-class home, he was the third child of 11, born to Jose Trujillo Valdez and Julia Altagracia Molino Chevalier. With such a large family, headed by an alcoholic and womanizing father, Rafael Leonidas was raised without affection and parental love. Rejection and lack of affection afflicted the whole family who were the bane of a large part of the community due to the illegal acts of the Trujillo brothers and even at times of the father. This situation led young Rafael Leonidas to seek the affection and protection of his uncle Plinio Pina Chevalier, an official in the Vasquez government who enjoyed social prestige and a comfortable living. Although he did participate in some of the capers of his larcenous brothers, he mostly made the effort to set himself apart from his poor environment, dressing impeccably and carefully minding his manners in front of other people. This is where his struggle for acceptance in high society had its roots. Although he did not get past the fifth grade in elementary school, he was able to obtain employment through his uncle's recommendations. First, he worked as a telegraph operator in San Cristobal, then as a night watchman for a sugar mill, and finally as an officer in the National Guard, which was created by the U.S. Marines. Even though he was an Army officer, and in spite of his numerous achievements, he was still repeatedly rejected by the exclusive social clubs of the snobbish Dominican society of that time. Coupled with inordinate pride and unfocused ambition, these rejections made a lasting impression on the young Trujillo and produced great resentment against those who would not accept him. To defeat the well-born and prestigious people who had rejected him, to dominate all facets of society which were hostile to him, either with money or with a fist, to make all men and women depend on him, and then to expand this enslaved world, those were the goals which he would carry with him throughout his life. It was with these deep-rooted feelings that he rose on August 16, 1930, to be sworn in as the constitutional president of the Dominican Republic. This was the Dominican Republic in 1930, a population of approximately 1,256,000. Of which 80% were rural and illiterate. Only three main roads in the whole country and just one railroad in the northern region. 
an economy based almost entirely on agriculture and oriented mainly toward export, with an almost total lack of internal markets. Its territory divided politically into 12 provinces, customs controlled directly by the U.S. government, an external debt of $20 million, which would have to be paid back promptly before it came due in 1940 and 42. And finally, a smothering financial crisis which affected all sectors of the population. On September 3, 1930, the city of Santo Domingo is destroyed by a powerful hurricane with winds of approximately 180 miles per hour. The hurricane, named San Senon, leaves 2,000 people dead, 6,000 injured, and 9,500 homeless. Trujillo confronts the tragedy with extraordinary leadership a great amount of energy and an intense capacity for work. He is seen everywhere, encouraging, organizing, and working with foreign experts who had come to help the city recover. Once the crisis is over, Trujillo's real work begins. What offers the most security to Trujillo are the armed men who surround him. He is keenly aware of who handles them and frequently removes men from posts of command, insisting constantly on their loyalty. Nadie es digno de la vida que le ha sido concedida por Dios como derecho de la existencia si no lleva como sello de la personalidad humana, el sentimiento de la lealtad como razón de ser de su paso por el mundo para cumplir un destino honorable en la tierra. Trujillo tightly controlled the armed forces which held a monopoly of all weapons in this country. Hearing rumors of a possible invasion by the political exiles, he undertook a grand tour of the country's 12 provinces accompanied by his cabinet and 1,400 army officers. In each of the provinces, he would prepare a parade where vast amounts of military equipment were exhibited, among which figured a battery of light artillery, shotguns, gas bombs, automatic rifles, sawed-off handguns, motorcycles, and various mules to carry the guns. The parades were headed by the army band directed by Lieutenants Jose Cerron and Rafael Ignacio. Trujillo was accompanied by Brigadier Vasquez Rivera, Colonel Pedro A. Estrella, Lieutenant Colonel Ernesto Perez, Fernando A. Sanchez, and Major Manuel Emil Castillo, as well as Captains Melido Marte, Fausto Camaño, and Antonio Leva Po. Only two civilians accompanied Trujillo on this military tour, Dr. Francisco Benzo and Joaquin Balaguer. The former was his family doctor who had come with him to look after his health, and the second, his favorite spokesman, 
to prepare his speeches and to correct his press releases. One of his followers at the time, paraphrasing Leonidas, the legendary Spartan king, declared, we are at peace under the shadow of weapons. August 2nd, 1931, the Dominican Party was founded. It would become an effective propaganda tool for control and vigilance over the citizens who were at Trujillo's disposal. Since it was the only party and to join was mandatory, any transactions with state offices and state organisms required the citizen to present the party identification card, popularly known as La Palmita, the Little Palm. The symbol adopted by the party was a royal palm, and its slogan was an acronym with the dictator's name, Rectitude, Rafael, Liberty, Leonidas, Trabejo, Work, Trujillo, Morality, Molina. These first years, Trujillo sets up a financial machine that backs his political administration. His power is strengthened when he enacts the State of Emergency Decree in 1931. Sheltered by this law, Trujillo takes economic measures that include a freeze on wages that is attributed to the external debt owed to the U.S. banks. He reduces the national budget by massive layoffs, by reducing wages, and by diminishing imports, therefore evening out the country's balance of trade. He designs a state political system with production incentives geared to grow rice, animal fats, cheese, and butter, and to produce shoes, furniture, as well as many other agricultural and manufactured goods. It was the creation of the internal markets that substituted for many of the major imports. The successful results of this political policy helped maintain control over the economic crisis that gripped the country. Trujillo was intelligent, serene, valiant, organized, and hardworking, and had extraordinary leadership qualities. He also knew the darker side of human nature, besides being extremely self-disciplined himself. He was culturally illiterate, but he was able to manipulate the most relevant intellectuals and therefore listen to them and use them in their projects. The mythification of Trujillo begins from the first days of his rise to power. Numerous honors and titles were being awarded to him, but only four were obligatory when mentioning him in public. Generalissimo of the National Armies, granted to him by Congress on May 21, 1933. Honorary Doctor, bestowed on him by the entire faculty of the University of Santo Domingo in October 1934. Father of the New Fatherland and Benefactor of the Fatherland also awarded by the Congress, this time in Santiago on August 16, 1933. 
el grande hombre, el héroe de Carlyle no tiene que ser poeta, ni pintor, ni escultor. Solo tiene que ser uno de esos hombres a quien Platón llamaba hombres divinos, a cuya zaga y seguimiento deben marchar todos los ciudadanos que viven bajo un buen gobierno, según aconsejaba el inmortal filósofo griego. Cuando a un pueblo lo rige uno de esos héroes o uno de esos hombres divinos, ese pueblo ve en él al auténtico protagonista de todo el acontecer de su cultura, porque es él quien enmarca y condiciona el perfil de su historia. Es el hombre necesario, lo repetimos, y ese es el caso de Trujillo. Y Trujillo, repito, no ha creado la nacionalidad, sí ha afianzado en cambio los elementos que la constituyen, integrándola de manera definitiva e imprimiéndola con los dedos de hierro de su voluntad creadora. El vigor y la consistencia con que de ahora en adelante perdurará en la historia. Quien ha sido capaz de llevar a cabo semejante obra es digno sin disputa del título de benefactor de la patria. Es acreedor a ese título y acreedor al título más grande todavía de padre y civilizador de la República. Trujillo ha completado el lugar de libertad e independencia que nació en la Unitaria. Duarte y Trujillo, a través del tiempo, enlazan sus manos en la culminación excelsa de un ideal de grandeza y de gloria para la República. Por eso Trujillo es el último de los trinitarios, por eso es el benefactor de la patria, por eso es el padre de la patria nueva. Trying to top accolades, Jacinto Pinato reached the pinnacle of servility and flattery by creating the supreme slogan, God and Trujillo, which later came more and more into use. When a Dominican expresses that he owes his bienestar to God and to Trujillo, no hace otra cosa que hacerse intérprete de este hecho pasmoso que se ha cumplido aquí por primera vez en la historia. La presencia de Trujillo en la patria es una realidad tan viva como lo es la presencia de Dios en el universo a través de sus obras y a través de sus constelaciones inmortales. With frequent references like these, the intellectuals were able to pass the tyrant Trujillo off as an immortal among men. They were able to generate feelings of admiration and personal veneration among the people that at the same time promoted submission and acceptance of the personal power of the dictator. To all this, one has to add the unlimited egomania of messianic proportions that Trujillo possessed. La República Dominicana afrontaba una angustiosa situación cuyas graves proporciones asemejaranse a las existentes en aquellos primeros años de nuestra vida republicana. Y fue precisamente entonces cuando, obedeciendo las exigencias de ese paralelismo histórico a que antes me referí y que parece inherente a la vida de los pueblos, las miradas de todos los dominicanos se volvieron hacia mí. Las miradas de todos los dominicanos se volvieron hacia mí. Las miradas de todos los dominicanos se volvieron hacia mí. But in spite of this illusion of grandeur and the intellectuals' efforts to deify him, the people in the streets and alleyways of his hometown of San Cristobal still refer to him in their private conversations by his childhood nickname of Chapitas. <laughs> In 
1934, the Dominican Party held its national convention in the city of San Cristobal, where Trujillo is chosen as the presidential candidate for the 1934-38 term. No me presento hoy ante la opinión nacional con nuevos programas y promesas. Puedo decir sencillamente que me doy todo entero a la patria, como he sido y como soy al aceptar ser postulado por el Partido Dominicano para la presidencia de la República en las elecciones del próximo 16 de mayo. No he de hacer revisión de mi pasado político para acreditarme ni para blasonar mi nombre. Me basta con comparecer ante la conciencia nacional para confiarme a sus veredictos, porque no tengo, no vengo en solicitud de sufragios, sino a empeñar mi palabra en que continuaré entregado con toda mi energía y capacidad a la obra de bien patio que he venido plasmando sin términos ni desmayos. Para el pueblo ha sido grato el grandioso noticio la del nuevo candidato que proclama la nación que gobierna el general es la voz de mi cristalla realizando su idea bajo luz de las estrellas Three months later, on August 16th, he was sworn in for the new term with Jacinto Peinado serving as vice president. Toward the middle of his second term, the pillars that sustained the chief's power were solidly set. The power of arms through an army controlled personally by him. The power of money through the control of the principal economic activity of the country. The legitimacy that he obtained by many actions, but above all the endorsement of the Catholic Church and the intellectuals that followed him. From the beginning of his rule, Trujillo demonstrated great concern for Haiti and the Haitians residing in the Dominican Republic. From 1930 to 1937, he made four trips to Haiti and he held an equal number of meetings with President Stenio Van Schaan, who returned the gesture by visiting Santo Domingo on various occasions. The first of these meetings was held in Cap Haitian and in Dehabon in October 1933. In this first meeting, Trujillo and Bonsant agreed to reinitiate the negotiations for establishing the definitive alignment of the Dominico-Haitian border. After intense negotiation in March 1936, Trujillo returned to Port-au-Prince and met with Vincent to sign the treaty that put an end to the border dispute and established the new Dominican-Haitian frontiers. During one speech in reference to the negotiations with Haiti, Trujillo asserted, it fills me with great pride to declare before my fellow countrymen and before the world that a large proportion of African blood runs through my veins. In 1935, according to the census dated from that year, 52,657 Haitians were living in the Dominican Republic. A large number of Haitian immigrants had established themselves in the northern region of the country next to the Haitian border and had created their own economic support base that included modest amounts of land, housing, cattle, and so forth. Active trade of a variety of products had developed with the residents on both sides of the border, 
And as a result, the Haitian currency circulated regularly in areas of Dominican territory, ignoring state controls. The existence of this economically autonomous community was not accepted by Trujillo's power structure, since one of the characteristics of his machine was the centralization and control of all political, economic, and social activity in the country. Trujillo could no longer tolerate this situation. At the end of 1937, the cherished project of Trujillo's intellectuals, the whitening of the race, the intolerance of any activities that disagreed with the dictatorial power structure, and the need for a scapegoat, which is normal in a tyrannical system. All this culminated in Trujillo's order for a massacre of horrendous, bloody, and perverse proportions. From September 28th to October 10th, over 15,000 men, women, and children, all Haitian nationals, were deprived of their lives and property by Trujillo's henchmen. In Trujillo's dictatorship, we find, as active participants, people who played diverse social roles, typical of an oppressive system. The politician. One of them performed a specific function. Nevertheless, it was as a group that individual actions, stances, and attitudes were defined. In all oppressive systems, there is at the disposal of the dominating sectors a person in charge of this singular task. But in the division of responsibility, the hired murderer allows those who are not in direct contact with death to remain as separate and untouched individuals. Each one refers to his own individuality in order to keep a distance from another's misery, or each will immerse himself in the group when attempting to conceal his own responsibility. Without hindrance, he contaminates the others. That is why murder is the responsibility of everyone.
Thank you.